Um, I'm really happy to be here at the Funky Buddha Lounge. As some of you may know, I am a Buddhist and rather funky. <laughs> I feel at home. <laughs> and I'm proud of it. Uh, tonight I'm going to read from Serotonin City and read uh, two pieces. There are two short chapters. Chapter 23, my 38th birthday. One of the presents I buy for myself in anticipation of my 38th birthday was something called an automata, a wooden toy made in England, which was a marvel of craftsmanship and whimsy. This particular automata depicted a tiny ship, a scene of a tiny ship being tossed on an unforgiving ocean, while a plane circled overhead. When you turned the crank, the wooden slats, which were the waves, began to wondrously churn, and the ship began to rock back and forth through an ingenious design of cranks and carpentry. Amazingly, the wooden plane also began simultaneously to circle the ship. I imagined it to be a rescue plane. On my computer, I printed off a label for my toy. I named it a ship to cross the sea of suffering. In honor of a Buddhist parable that encouraged me during my depression. When I was depressed, I wouldn't have had the energy to go into a store and purchase such a toy. I wouldn't have had the energy to turn the tiny wooden crank that throws the ocean into such divine motion. Now, as I blew up my balloons to hang from the ceiling for my birthday bash, I envisioned sharing the toy with people at the party inviting the guests to turn the crank. <laughs> I would tell them that by turning the crank, they were rescuing themselves. They were setting into motion the forces that might save them. I had put flyers under the doors of all my first floor neighbors. Joanne arrived on schedule with her hors d'oeuvres. My mother appeared with the cake she ordered from the house of fine chocolates. <laughs> Inscribed in blue icing with the words, To Dwight, Happy 38th, Happy Return to Earth. <laughs> the inscription was a celebration not only of my birthday, but of my recovery. My return to the land of the living. And before I could smack the first bag of ice on the kitchen sink, releasing the cubes into a huge plastic tub, the party was in full swing. Hours and many guests later, the party began to wind down. A sheepishly smiling young African-American woman appeared at my propped open door. It was Sandra, my next door neighbor, whose laugh I heard so many nights through the wall. I welcomed her in, guiding her to the chocolate cake, to the punch bowl, which still boasted one melting island of pineapple sherbet. At last I got to talk to the woman behind the laugh. I learned she was a school teacher, that she had traveled to Europe and Africa, that she had volunteered as a security guard for the Olympics in, the, in Atlanta. She had just gotten off work from the art house movie theater where she worked part-time. I was glad she came. The party was a success. A good time was had by all. Though I didn't know it yet, this was to be my last party on Surf Street. In a few years, the building which I had lived in faithfully for over a decade would change hands. The new owners would jack up the rents to reflect the rapidly gentrifying neighborhood of Lakeview. 
leaving Sandra and I priced out. But on this miraculous night, I didn't know any of that, and I didn't need to. I only knew that I had thrown a party for my loved ones, and my loved ones came. called The Prayer Cycle by Jonathan Elias. That's great. The second and final piece of the evening is uh, something I discovered as I was going through my mood swings about the house you live in, the house you live in and the furniture you sit on. This is called Follow the Furniture, an Epiphany. If you want to know how a person is feeling, follow the furniture. Monitor how long their bed, the pictures on the wall, the chairs, and table, how long each of these has been in the same position. For I propose to you that a house at rest may be a house depressed, <laughs> and that a house in motion is a loved house. The week starting July 1st, 1996, will go down in history for me as the week that Prozac kicked in. I felt the miracle of vitamin P three months after I'd started taking it right on schedule. This was to be my epiphany week, a time of great revelation and joy. And it was the migration of household things that told me I was coming back. Tables shifting in the night. Pictures flying from one wall to the other, not an intervention by angels or ghosts, but by a force much more powerful. Objects moved, most assuredly by me, but pushed into place by passion. My studio apartment became a Ouija board. <laughs> it spelled out one simple message. You are coming back to life. And I could feel the truth of the prediction. I was starting to care about things again. I was starting to dread things a little less. A week's vacation lay ahead of me. I was determined to start writing a new play after 10 months of silence. But first, I had to transform my apartment from a place of exile to a writer's place where the imagination could take flight. First off, my computer needed to be placed more centrally in my apartment. Sleep had been the center of my life. Now the bed had to yield so that writing could take center stage. Next, the television, which had become my object of worship over the past several months, needed to be unplugged. I taped a sheet of paper across the face of its screen. Watching TV creates no value. <laughs> It's true. Unless you're in the TV business. I put it in a corner of my apartment and, to, and turned it toward the wall like a punished pupil. Finally, around 5 a.m. as the sun was coming up on the first day of my writer's vacation, I went to bed. When I woke up later that morning, my eyes opened on a reinvented world. My computer now sat on the table in the geometric center of my apartment daring me to write. And lo and behold, I started writing. Hard to remember that just months ago, I was in the depths of despair, lying flat on my back in the middle of the floor, staring up at my stucco ceiling, the afternoon light draining from what was left of my Saturday. The self-interrogation began while I remained horizontal. Will I ever be happy again? Not likely. How can I live up to my potential? Having a clue. What makes me feel alive? I wish I knew. But a couple of prescriptions of Prozac and some enlightening sessions of cognitive therapy later, the questions yielded much different answers. 
I found myself again horizontal, but this time I was lying in bed in the arms of a new friend whom I like making fruit smoothies with. <laughs> the Q&A went something like this. Will I ever be happy again? I already am, but thanks for asking. How can I live up to my potential? Do what you love, and eventually you'll make money at it. What makes me feel alive? Everything. Exactly. Everything. Thank you.